thank you very much, Sue. Yeah, I'm so pleased to be here. It's um, and it's hybrid. Yeah, I'm absolutely <laughs> delighted. This is, as I said to you, this is a way forward, isn't it? Um, I really, you are so right. Isn't it time that we actually really reclaimed our profession as midwives? Um, our profession is to guide women and birthing people through their journey uh, through birth. And um, that is, uh, we have a specific job to do. And I really feel that what's happening in the maternity world is hindering us and hindering birth completely. So that's what we're actually going to talk about uh, because there are things that we can do. We need to remind ourselves of that. So, um, so I'm assuming I can share the screen now. Yeah. Um, just do that now and present. So is that all right for your side there? It's just coming up. Should be here in a moment. There we are. Got it. Okay. Um, so, I'll, oops, Ooh, just managed to put that forward. Let's go back a little bit there to where we need to be. So here we are, this, are we getting it right? And indeed, that is something that we all need to reflect on. What is happening in, uh, in the birth world as far as physiology is concerned, birth physiology? We are made to give birth. We have the ability to do that and to do it well for the majority of us. Sometimes we run into problems. Very grateful for our NHS and all the machines that go bang and the uh, skills of the obstetricians, of course, when we need them. But the majority shouldn't, and yet the majority um, actually get it, uh, intervention. But here we are. We've got um, uh, relaxin that loosens the pelvic ligaments, making space for the baby uh, to pass through. We've got the sacrum and the iliac bones widening and um, sp specific positions and movements will increase or decrease certain parts of the pelvis. That's, of course, that's wonderful because the pelvis is an exquisite articulated architectural structure that should be respected and honored and celebrated. It is wonderful. And yet we're not getting that message, are we? We're kind of gone into a bit of a decline thinking, oh yeah, it's not very good that pelvis. It's too small, it's too big, it's this, it's that. No, I think we really need to start trusting it. Um, and in fact, our organizations are supporting that, certainly in theory. We have the NMC saying encourage mobility and, um, and support the woman to, or the woman, obviously birthing person is included there, to achieve optimal positions in labor and for birth. We've got the RCM doing the same. Midwives should support women to adapt, adopt any position they choose during labor and birth and to change position as and when they want to. Nothing wrong with that, very right and proper, seems logical. And even nice guidelines encourage and help the woman to move and adopt whatever position they find most comfortable throughout labor. Now that, is absolutely right and proper. That's what we should be doing. That optimizes birth physiology. And it seems a very logical thing to do. Let's have a look at the advantages and the disadvantages of mobilizing during the birth process. What's the evidence? Well, lots of advantages. Walking and upright positions in the first stage of labor reduces the duration of the first and second stage of it reduces the risk of cesarean birth. It reduces the need for epidural because we can cope better when we move around. That's a very well-known thing, backed up by research and evidence. Then um, it reduces intervention. And women and birthing people report less severe pain and increased, satisfac increased satisfaction with their experience, much more than women in a semi-recumbent or supine and lithotomy position. That's the evidence. There's been studies telling us that's the case. And of course, as we know, it does seem very logical that that would be the case when you think of birth physiology. So what are the disadvantages of mobilizing during the birth process? Well, if you can find some, <laughs> I would love to see it because I could find none. 
biomechanically is advantageous. Flexible sacrum positions, kneeling, standing, squatting and sitting positions are all more beneficial as they allow a higher coccyx, coccyx movement and lower widening of the pubic symphysis, which is actually beneficial for our bodies and how we recover as well. So we're not damaging ourselves as we give birth. We want to optimise our physiology, not harm it. So that's really all straightforward, isn't it? And now we have somebody there in the picture hanging from a bar. This is in a hospital room um, because we think, oh, yes, that will happen in, at home and in birthing units. And indeed, it does happen a lot that people are mobilising. So why not in the obstetric unit and the labour ward? And there's somebody in that very room hanging onto a bar that's attached to the bed. So are we getting it right then? The optimal birth position is the one chosen instinctively. And I put that on Twitter recently and it did provoke a, a few comments, which were very reasonable because it's like, I have to say, I say this because I've worked at home and in birthing units and people are more likely to behave instinctively in those environments than they are in that very busy hospital room. It's true. I'm not suggesting that it's really easy, given the institutional restrictions and the culture. But we have to look at what's happening and really think about it. Is it helpful? Significant number of women and birthing people are telling us they are not free to move or change position during some or all of their labour. Now, you yourself might think, well, I always try to help. And that is brilliant. There are midwives and, uh, who are doing that. Absolutely there are. But there is a culture that exists that makes it really difficult for that to happen and challenging. 83% are giving birth on a bed. And the majority of them are semi-recumbent or supine. 24% of them are having unassisted vaginal births in lithotomy. Can you imagine? Now, that's from CQC. It's been like that for a few years. Those figures haven't changed much at all. 1% here, half a percent there. It's really stuck there. That's, that's what's happening. We think, of course, the bed is in the middle of the room, so people tend to go there, don't they? But if we think about choice, and you remember what we were just looking at, RCN, NICE, um, um, uh, NMC, they're all saying, yes, people should have the right to choose, informed decision-making, informed choice, of course. But do you really think that 80, or so 82% there, that was a drop from last time, it was 83, now it's 82%, that's actually going the right way. But um, 82%, do you think 82% actually chose to be on the bed and the majority of them to be lying, supine or semi-recumbent. Semi if some of them did and some of them may have chosen that position, that is fine. That is no problem. They are optimizing. If they did it instinctively, they are optimizing their physiology because the baby is inside their unique pelvis in a position that they know because they have that baby inside of them and they have that they have that inside knowledge so if they chose to suddenly and we've seen it somebody being maybe upright and suddenly throwing themselves round and lying flat on their back <laughs> we think oh what's happening we don't want her to lie flat but no it's right for her of course we don't start to interfere she chose that herself and there's the there's the issue 82 percent did not choose those positions. 24% did not choose lithotomy. Those were chosen by the care provider because it suited us, it was convenient for us. Lithotomy and supine positions are not an advantage unless you chose them yourself. They increased the risk of severe perineal trauma you have a comparatively longer labour, you have greater pain, and it's a decrease in satisfaction and control, and there are more um, fetal heart rate patterns that we get concerned about. 
So there's an issue. This is not helping. So why is that happening? Why do we have so many restrictions in the birth room? And it's in the obstetric room. I'm really happy to hear that um, some labor um, boards are changing, obstetric units are changing their rooms. It's really, really brilliant. They're really starting to see that, but it's only few and far between. The majority are really are quite medicalized. And then the majority of women and birth people are giving birth in that environment. That's where most of the births take place. Whether you have complications or not, whether you have health issues or not, that's the kind of environment giving birth in. So Hensi Gore and Amy Romano's book, oh, uh, Optimal Care and Childbirth, I've forgotten. <laughs> I think that's what it's called. I've got it at the end of this presentation. They are looking at all the evidence. It's been around for a wee while, but it's still very, very relevant to this book. And in this book, they mention, um, they suggest four alternatives to the four Ps. I've changed it a wee bit. Um, so is it possible? Is it possible to move? Is there freedom to, cho cho to choose your position and to mobilize? Have you got space? Is there a pool? Are there floor marks? Are there alternatives to that bed because the bed is very dominant? What kind of practices are happening in the birth room that really curtail mobilization and choice? Well, being connected to things is the main obstacle to mobility. That is what women and birthing people are saying. And of course, we know that's true, don't we? The CTG, electronic fetal monitoring, has changed the birth room. I hope not forever. I still really do feel that this needs to be challenged, not only because it stops that person from getting up and moving around. Well, I know we've got telemetry. Is it ever plugged in, in your unit? You've got it, you've got one, maybe, or two. Some of you will have had more than that, and some of you have got a little telemetry, and I'm grateful for the possibility of increasing the chance of moving around in birth and not being hindered by um, a machine. But the majority don't have this, the majority have one or two telemetry, if any, and they are sometimes not plugged in, and midwives aren't overly keen because sometimes they still don't uh, produce the quality of trace that is necessary for, um, for that unit, that, that what they want to, to see. So we hold the woman down for that, we say, I'm sorry that you can't move around because we need this to happen because this is taking what we're actually saying is this machine is taking priority over your needs over your physiology and yet when we look back at the evidence that's an outrage so we should be challenging that first of all we really should be challenging efm and if you don't know kirsten small you should please do look her up She's an obstetrician in Australia who's dismantling and looking at all this evidence. She's dismantling this whole issue of we need this continuous electronic fetal monitoring everywhere. She's having a good look at that and she's very worth um, reading her blogs. So we should be challenging, that, challenging the incredibly low evidence and sometimes very, really no evidence to support continuous fetal monitoring for the majority of people who get it. Um, uh, but also that we really need to be considering how are we going to manage mobilisation. That should take priority. Um, as I say, the I mean, I, we also know the dominant feature being the bed. Uh, women and birthing people are walking through that room and they go to that bed, don't they? And they get on the bed. So, you know, this is a media thing and this is what we see. When I teach birth preparation classes, I ask, where do you give birth? Where do you see birth taking place? And they sit on the bed. So it's not surprising that they might think that is the best place to go to. And certainly it looks like the only place you can go to to get really comfy. Um, and uh, it's soft, and, but it, it isn't. Um, it needs to change. We need to rearrange that room. Of course, we want comfort. We do want a bed because it's nice to lie down and have a wee rest. Of course we do. But it's just such a dominant feature and everything seems to happen on there. 
And uh, you might have the most wonderful environment. And you have got the possibility to move around. But if you don't have the person, the care provider in that room with the right ethos, the right culture, the right attitude, and that's a known thing as well, that we have evidence that supports what I'm saying. If you don't have that person who really supports you to move and optimize your physiology, to support your physiology, then all of those things have little uh, value. So even if you have a medicalized room, if you go in with the attitude of we are going to enable you to support you, to protect your physiology, to optimize your physiology, you will do what you can in with what you've got. So it can happen. And there are a few pictures. Now the left is, um, well in a moment actually, Sue, so I wanted to just show a little video um, of how we can change the room. So I've got that uh, link on my screen, but I've sent you the link. So if that could come up in a moment, that would be great. On the left-hand side, we've got um, a birthing room in Lush and Greenwich, I think, um, birthing, uh, oh, sorry, Lewisham <laughs> Hospital uh, is the birth unit. And it's a lovely room, look at that. We don't all get the chance to have those lovely rooms, but I think we should aim, and we know that that's a possibility, then why can't we have it? Well, we know we haven't got the funds and so on, but we can aim to make it better. This is beautiful. And actually, I think that's what everybody deserves to have, a beautiful place, a beautiful place to give birth, to support the physiology and all and everything, neurohormonal, uh, emotional, the works. Uh, and I love that picture. But then we have on the right hand side, this is from Northern Ireland, and this is very much, it could be even an obstetric um, ward or or it could be a, a kind of makeshift um, midwife ledge unit that's just been using the, the, the building that's available to them. Um, but uh, just a little bit of space, something to make it look a little bit more cosy, change the shape of the bed, throw a nice cover on it, make it feel a little different so people are more likely to climb on there and use different positions if they need to, and to use the balls and the hanging rope just to, it gives them the impression that they can do this. So, um, Sue, I don't know if you're able to get that little video up, or should I click on it? I don't know. It's yours. Oh, I bet. Yours I'm impressed technology. that you're managing to do it. Thank you. I mean, it's just a, it shows you what you can do in the bathroom. Now, as I said, sometimes you can be met with some scorn, even by your own colleagues. Yesterday, I was in Wolverhampton teaching. Um, I teach all over the place. And, and some of the midwives were really keen on doing this sort of thing, moving the bed out of the way. Now, I'm not talking about Wolverhampton specifically, but where they used to work in places, different places. They say, well, sometimes it's really hard because somebody says, well, why have you done that? Why have you pushed that aside? The bed should be here because that's how we always do it, so to speak, or because we need it in case there's an emergency. You, you know what? You can move the bed really easily. It takes a, like five seconds to get those brakes off and, and move it out of the way so it can be accessible from all sides. It's highly unusual that you would need that. There you are, there's the... Just pushing it to the side. It's a very medicalized room, but at least that bed is moved out of the way, still usable. Oh, wow. <laughs> and how, what a nice change. It's got machinery, it's got the works for even complicated situations, people who need pumps and all the rest of it. Thank you so much for getting that up. And uh, I'm very impressed that you managed to do that. That's brilliant. Um, I'll just get my, uh, my screen back on. Um, so, um, yes, um, and, and, and Wolverhampton, they were really trying to do that. It's wonderful, very admirable. Other hospitals are saying the same. We're trying to do that. We're trying to push it out of the way. But sometimes you do meet colleagues who dig their heels in and say, no, that's not right. Well, actually, we need to have a conversation about that, don't we? And that, in fact, that's my logo as well. Changing the conversation. We do need to do that. We need to change the conversation. What 
is it that is um, happening in those birth rooms? And are we getting it right? Are we optimizing the supporting? So um, just, that's it, lovely. Oops, that's it, yeah, okay. I mean, that's a challenge. It's a challenge for everyone. I think you've got to really reflect. If you're somebody who doesn't feel that you should move the bed out of the way, really reflect on that. Why? What are the chances? What, what, what are the disadvantages? Write them down. What's the disadvantages of pushing it to the side and what are the advantages? So which one? And, what, and look at the possibilities. So, you know, really wash it out because this is not a little thing. And I just sit here before we, I don't know how much time I've got, Sue, but this is so important. Um, five minutes, okay, I'm just going to throw this in. This is so important. And I think what we've forgotten as midwives, a lot of us, and it's been kind of pushed, you know, thumped into us, actually, in the institution, is that our job as uh, um, somebody who, who, uh, people who optimise and support birth physiology, we also have a skill and an art that's called watchful attendance. And I gleaned all my information, not all my information, but a lot of information from the women and birthing people themselves. How were they moving? What were they saying? Asking them, where do you feel your baby? This baby's inside them. Let's talk to them and, and find out where appropriate, of course. Um, and, 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 and creating the environment and, and the attitude of you can do this. We are going to support your physiology. We are going to support you. And this is all part and parcel of our job as midwives. And yet it's denigrated. It's denigrated into being fluffy as not that valuable. And yet it's incredibly valuable. And we need to start reclaiming that and creating the right birth space is part of that. So never underestimate the power of moving that bed to the side or switching, getting the mats in and have a conversation with a colleague who suggests that it's not important. I could go on much more than that. I had to stop myself because it's <laughs> such an important um, skill. This is us. This is what we do as midwives. And uh, what, what, what we're becoming if we don't do our job um, as, as, as supporters. Um, and anyway, there we are. What, so we're creating uh, space inside and outside. This is what we can do. This is a marvellous job, what a profession. And if we know how to do that, we can change the way people give birth and make it more joyful because people are struggling. Women are coming up against real difficulties in these birth rooms, not just from the, the physical environment, but from the practices and the things that we do. So sometimes things do need a little bit of a hand in this uh, she can't find that instinctive movement uh, by herself, you may need to guide and give um, suggestions. And for example, on the left-hand side, this is a lovely midwife from Kingston, who is actually showing, uh, um, using the peanut ball uh, to facilitate more space in the pelvis by rotating, internally rotating the femur. And that's what she's doing. That picture shows you that knee is lower than the ankle and that will open up the outlet and that's a very handy thing to know isn't it you could do that with a lithotomy bed, a pole if you're on that bed yeah and I know because we've got to work with what we got as well it's not going to change overnight I do want you to consider all these things that I've said before but I know we're going to have to be patient so people are going to have epidurals people are going to be on the bed let's optimize the space for them um, uh, where we can. And uh, that's one of the, uh, the, the positions we could use with a peanut ball. I do hope you've got peanut balls. Um, right on the other side, on the right-hand side, um, this is at Chelsea Miss Minster, actually. And this midwife is demonstrating a modified sideline release. Now, the, the, she's lying in a very um, straight position, shoulders are stacked hips are stacked, it has to be done just right so that it just stretches a little bit of the muscle and fascia inside the pelvis and makes a wee bit of space just like that very, very quickly. Um, it can be, I mean, it's not going to resolve long-term um, pelvic issues or imbalance, but it will provide a wee bit of space at that time. And that's all we need when you're having a baby, just, um, just for an hour or two 
just to have a little bit more space. But this works beautifully and it can be used with an epidural. And in the middle, you've got shaking alpha tree, which is a lovely um, um, technique. It's used all over the world. And you're using a scarf to jiggle those big muscles in the, the back of your pelvis, the glutes, and also the piriforms that comes out from the sacrum over onto the leg and the obturator internus is actually um, it's part of the, um, the pelvic floor, as is the piriformis. They're all getting a little shake and a little jiggle. And you can do the thighs as well. And you can use this, a towel, hospital towel. I used to use a, a towel for that. Um, and it will just jiggle and free up and loosen. And that is a good thing when we're having a baby. That's what we want. We want to be freed up, a little looser, a little more relaxed, so our babies can come through much more easily. And um, you can use asymmetrical positions just lift. And we see women doing this, don't we? We see women just suddenly, they might be kneeling and suddenly they lift their leg up. And that's instinctive. They're just doing something that they know is right for them. We don't have to be too cerebral, uh, cerebral about it. We just need to know that actually some movements will create more space, and that's a good thing. And there's the peanut bowl. Now, if you haven't got a peanut bowl or several peanut bowls, please get some. They're not very costly. I think they're a tenner. We spend thousands of pounds on CTG machines that don't have a lot of evidence, that can cause harm, that fix people onto beds, and yet we can't find a tenner or two for peanut oil, that while they're fixed onto that bed, they can at least have something that will open up their pelvis. Thank you, I'm just about done now. So pelvic, uh, we know, and again, we've got evidence for this. This is uh, uh, increases pelvic diameter, reduces the length of labor, reduces the cesarean infection uh, rate, um, aids rotation and descent, and aids asymmetrical positions, particularly good for asynchronous babies. This is something we need to all be using much more. In the end, this is what it's about. Upright positions, release the sacrum, use gravity. We know that's wonderful, but we must never be prescriptive. Really what we're aiming for is to uh, enable uh, choice and decision-making from the woman in birth and person, what's best for her. But if we do know what can help them, then we can make some uh, offer guidance as well. Just a note, left lateral position does seem to be better than upright for women with an epidural in that bump study. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, well, we could talk much more about this subject. It's my favourite subject, of course. I could talk for weeks on it. But um, I do hope that's given you an idea and we can start simply. It doesn't have to be complicated. Just make more space. Um, here are some of the references at the end. I think you all get a chance to um, have this presentation. And I do a breast preparation class, teacher breast preparation class for pregnant parents because they need to know this information. I think we all need to know it. Um, and um, that they can help themselves then. And if you're interested, I do have uh, professionals courses too, biomechanics for birth, and that's my website.